The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. We say it's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, and overt sins. What you have to do to get back to spirituality, because it is a spiritual book, the Holy Spirit is the key author of uh, learning and application, living. First uh, John 1.9, if we confess our sins, remember it could be in those three categories or others, but certainly those for you to examine. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and that's the key. That is the key. Remember, this is your moment of silence to confess sin if necessary or to have a prayer for God to teach you. He will really teach you something important in your life tonight. This lesson is, I, I miss nobody in this study tonight. So our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way to study with us out of the Word of God, both by automobile and by Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would inspire us. You know, the Bible itself will do that under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. All scriptures inspired. God breathed. That's what we need, Father. We need that Holy Spirit to breathe that word of God in us and just bring us into a new relationship. Not only with you, but with each other. And uh, I pray, Father, through this study of new covenant sanctification, we could understand that. Uh, it's, a, it's a lost doctrine. People talk around it and don't talk about it. But we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, la last week we studied uh, five aspects of the new covenant sanctification showing you how important it is to our dispensation, the church age, and how important it is to your life. And um, I remember, I can remember, uh, this was one of the things that uh, I never could get any answers on that were mechanical. You know, people would talk in broad terms about sanctification, and everybody had a different view on it. And so I, you know, I was, left out in the cold because I didn't want a whole lot. Of, I mean, I couldn't juggle and figure out which one was right. The one that stuck on the wall or the one that dropped. <laughs> well, I didn't know. And uh, uh, I happened to attend a, a pastor's conference out in, out in Houston uh, uh, with Bob Thiem, and he happened to deal with this subject matter over the course of that week and um, really broke that that thing down and, and I mean just it was one of those revolutionary concepts that a uh, light goes off in your soul and you go like whoa and uh, so I'm going to I'm going to show you three things about sanctification that's really important for the foundational structure of your belief system on the theology of new covenant sanctification and it comes out of our text by the way uh, the text that we're at in our study on Tuesday night out of, Ro out of Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. We're in chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. But I wanted to stop and spend a little bit of time here to introduce you to this subject matter in a very, uh, I, I think, mechanical way that you might understand sanctification. The problem with people, they don't understand the, the three phases of sanctification. And so they get them all jumbled up. They get doing these balls type of stuff, and it just gets confusing. I know it was for me. And this doctrine right here just cleared it up for me. I went, oh, oh wow. Simplicity is the name of the game for me. It's got, it's got to be kind of simple for me to start with to get it. And, and so this is a, a one-on-one lesson on it. But verse, verse, verse 9 and 10 are very important. But here's verse 10 on your paper. It says, by this will, which is verse 9, the, the will of God that says it's time to, there, there will be a time when Christ comes into the world that will, settle, will set aside the first covenant and establish the second covenant, right? The new covenant, the old covenant. So that's verse 9. And that's the will he's talking about in verse 10. 
right? I mean, it's pretty, I mean, that's, that's pretty obvious if you read verse 9. By this will established, now it, it actually goes back to verse 5, but verse 9 certainly tells you what he's talking about. By this will, setting aside the old covenant and establish the new covenant, we have been sanctified. And this is, this is a, a new, fresh, wonderful doctrine under the banner of the new covenant. And remember I told you last time, that, that the word we have been sanctified is a, is a perfect paraphrastic. Now, don't get crazy with that. I mean, I have to tell you that to make the big money. Say. But th that, that's, it's not as big as it sounds. Now, it, so it sounds kind of like, ooh, uh, a perfect paraphrastic. But all it means is there's a helping verb, there, there, and with this, there is Imi, which is an absolute status. I can't tell you how important this is now. That's an abs Imi is an absolute status quo verb of existence. It is translated in the English is. Or when God says, I am that I am, that's, that's what they're talking about. It's an absolute status verb of existence. And the part itself identifies what it's existence about. Are you with me? Now, when you get to the word sanctified, has having been sanctified, uh, understanding that is, has been. See, you can't see that. See, all you see is the perfect tense. The perfect tense is has been sanctified. See, so you don't see the imi there. It's lost in the power of the perfect tense. But see, that imi is really, really important in the Greek language. It makes it what we call a perfect paraphrastic. All right. And the is is as important as the sanctification. Is is an absolute status quo verb of existence. And we're talking about being sanctified, having been sanctified, right? And the perfect tense deals with completed. What, you know, completed in the past, the results or remains completed forever. So the big word with the perfect tense is what? Please tell me completed. Listen to it again. Here's the perfect tense. Completed in the past, with the results, it remains completed now and forever. See, the word is completed. All right? And so wherever, whatever, whatever verb it's connected to, that's what it always means. Now, the subject of it might change all the time, right? Because perfect tense will go with any verb. What our subject is today is what? Sanctification. Sanctification. And he's going to tell you when sanctification comes into existence in your life. We, church age believers, we have been sanctified. Now, it's a perfect tense, means completed. Sanctification has been completed. At some point in your life, it be, it's completed. The passive voice is the voice of grace. Is the voice where the it, it, the it's acting the subject is acting with it. it. It acts upon the subject, okay? And that's the word been has been is the passive voice. The passive voice means the subject is receiving this, it, and, that, and that's really important because listen, the subject we is the subject receiving this means that it's coming from outside to the inside. It's independent of you. And the, the who does depend on? Christ. When you believe in Christ, he brings that. You are sanctified in Christ. See, that's the theology of it. You have that? So this is something independent of you. And, 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 this, and this, the participle, listen to me now. The participle is positional sanctification. Positional. Salvation. And all of that's in that, in that, in that uh, perfect paraphrastic. Every bit of that, every bit of that that I just taught you comes out of the Greek formation of that structure. And how, how wonderful that is, huh? I mean, just that work, we have been sanctified is one, is a, ver, ver, a participle that has all that theology in it. Man, it's pretty powerful. Uh, hegiazo is the is the word for sanctified. Hegias 
uh, that's, this is the verbal form of hagios, which is the word holy, saint, sanctified business. Uh, and then the second part of this verse, verse 10, I'm in, I'm in Hebrews 10, 10. The second part of this verse is really important. It says, now watch, we have been sanctified, something outside of ourselves. Now he tells us what that was. By means of, that's dia plus the ablative, by means, that's dia plus the ablative is translated through or by the means of the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Now, what is that? Well, that's the gospel in it. The, you know, the, he, he's going to die on the cross for our sins, be buried and raised from the dead. The offering of the body of Christ. That, 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 that specifically puts him on the cross. Okay? And then he tells us once for all. So we're sanctified by something outside of ourselves that's independent of us. And now we're told it is the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are sanctified in Christ. And you're going to see this now once you learn that. You'll see sanctified in Christ all over the scriptures of the New Testament. All over the New Testament. So here, here's the truth. Let's say... See, a lot of people think they come in, listen, when did that happen to you? It happened the moment you believed. Let's say you were 13 and you heard a gospel, a very clear gospel, and you knew that if you didn't believe that gospel like me, who was 21 when he did it, that if you died, you'd go to hell. Okay? Now, I believe that in my soul. The only way out of that deal was to believe the gospel, that he died for my sins, was buried. And if I believe that, I'm told, I'm told in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, the gospel is that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. I'm told in Romans 1, 16, that if I believe that, the gospel that I just believe, the gospel is the power of God to save me. And Ephesians 2, 8, 9, the third verse of importance to us, is that we're saved by grace through faith and not of herself as a gift of God, not of works. At least any man should, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work that's done outside of you, independent of you. And when you believe it, it becomes part of you. But how good is that? And that's the absolute truth. You know how, you remember who used to do that? Saturday Night Live. That, that's before, that, that was the old, good old days of Saturday Night Live. Um, so he, he, here's what's important. Here's, here's what's important about the doctrine of sanctification. There are three phases to the plan of God. There's simply three phases of the plan of God for the believer to understand. If, if you want to grow spiritually, you've got to understand that three, there are three parts to the plan of God that are important to your life for spiritual growth. We call it phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one is salvation. Phase two is the Christian way of life. Phase three is the believer in eternity. And ideally, in a resurrection body. Right? Ideally. And so we call that, in theology, they call that, they call salvation, they call it positional sanctification, which he's talking about in, in Hebrews 10.10. 10. And then uh, experiential sanctification is the Christian life. And then ultimate sanctification is you in eternity. Now listen, you know why the other two work? You know why phase two and three work? Because you got phase one. <laughs> if you don't have phase one, then phase two sanctification and phase three sanctification is not going to work. It, you got to have, and that's Hebrews 10.10. 10. You got to have the first one. And how do you get it? By grace. And listen, listen to me now. This is important. If you have number one, you whether you have a function in two or three, if, if whether you have a function in two, you will get three. Now, that's important because some people say, well, you may have it in one, but you can lose it in three because you didn't do what he told you in verse two, in phase two, right? Yeah. Not true. You know how I know that? You know how I know that? You know how I know it from Hebrews 10.10? 10? Tell me. Because the word in the perfect tense of sanctification, is it's in the perfect tense. What's that mean? Completed. Completed in the past, present, and future. 
So that's phase one, two, and three. And that's 101 Greek. I'm not, I'm not laying anything heavy on you. That's 101 Greek. If you went to 101 Greek and we went through the verbal structure of our, of our verbs in the Greek, you would, be, you would learn that. I mean, that is how, how the perfect tense works. So you could apply it to any time you see a perfect tense. Uh, it's a little tricky to teach him paraphrastic on it, but that's okay. So under point one, the, uh, sanctification works in three phases of the plan of God, which I explained. Uh, 1 Corinthians one thirty is a wonderful verse, and, and we use it for a lot of different theology doctrines, key doctrines. If you want to know four key doctrines, here they are. The, to, by his doing, by his doing, not yours, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who become to us the wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Four major big doctrines of the new covenant. Uh, and by the way, my study tonight is, is, a, is a, a milk doctrine. I teach it a little heavy, right? I mean, you know, I, because I, I know the languages, so I'm going to use them. But um, it, it's a basic doctrine. Every, every new convert should learn this. Boy, I wish somebody had set me down and taught me that. Saved me a trip to New York. Trying to get the Holy Spirit. That had been helpful. <laughs> phase two, uh, uh, point two. Uh, phase one, uh, new covenant sanctification is based on grace, salvation, and the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we mentioned in our introduction. Listen to me. When you're talking about positional sanctification, phase one, that's the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. When you believe it, Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God's salvation. And then you realize this important fact that you're saved by grace through faith and not yourself. Now, th this right here, positional sanctification, when you believe that, you are in Christ. We call that and positionally sanctified, set apart under the holiness of God. That's what the Greek word means on your paper, H-A-G-I-A-Z-O, Hagiazo. That means set aside, that, say that's the word holy, holiness, set aside unto the holiness of God. And we call this positional sanctification. And you get that, you get that from this, Right? How do I know that? Hebrews 10 10. 10 10? Look, 10 10. I don't know 10 Zen, but <laughs> I just, I dropped out of the English into what's Zen? Uh, Chinese or something? Who, who knows? Oh, just spoken tongues, I guess. I, it's a miracle. Uh, listen to what he says. By his will, we have been sanctified. It's a perfect paraphrase. Watch this now. How? Through something outside of herself, independent, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. See, when, when, when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to see you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ, and we call that positional truth. And, and, and you are set apart into the holiness of God, and, it, and, and it's complete. Is that completed? It is completed. There's your security. It is completed. Agreed? That's the perfect tense of the word. You are sanctified. Your sanctification, your sanctification based on the perfect tense is what? Completed. And there's nothing because how did you get it? Right here. The offering of the body of Christ. You sanctified by means of, dia plus the ablative, by means of, that's the word through, Right there. And that's a done deal, as we say. Right? Is completed a done deal? Yeah. 
And listen, this, this sanctification and this baptism of the Holy Spirit, working in a combine, working in combine, is two of the eight works of the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation in the 50 things. You know that little pamphlet, the 50 things? Uh, you should always keep one of those with you. That your driver's license gets you to heaven. <laughs> uh, well, what do you think about that, Miss Jane? Now, hey, I put you over there. Don't be talking to nobody. Just because I put you over there. Positional sanctification. Listen to Romans 5.16. To be a minister of, of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. This Paul's talking about his ministry to the Gentiles. To be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. He's talking about those saved by the grace of God. Boy, that's, that's sanctified by what? Yeah, by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's who place it. The baptism of the Holy Spirit will place you in Galatians. 327, right? Baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Every church age believer receives positional sanctification at the moment of grace salvation. 2 Th Thessalonians 2, 13, 14. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through the sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. See that? Here's faith. There's how you get it right there. Faith in the gospel puts you into sanctification in Christ. Boom. We call it positional sanctification because you... You're placed by the baptism into Christ. You're, you are sanctified in Christ. That's what that means. Uh, an, another, another, uh, I, sometime when I give you additional scriptures, it's always good to look them up, not now, but later, like 1 Corinthians 6, 11. It's a good one. I, I only give you the good ones. I don't give you no half rotten apple. I give you the good ones. Now, here's the third point. Miss Jane, we're just buzzing through here tonight. We're just chunking through here. If I quit talking to you, we get done. Phase two, new phase two, new uh, new covenant sanctification is ba based on two things. They're, they're both based on walking, and this is really important. You get this. These are the two. These are the two. These are the two things. That's going to put you into, into experiential positional truth. These are, th these are the keys. I mean, these are the, these are the keys uh, to the Christian life sanctification. You got to walk by means of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you know, Gal Galatians, you got to walk. Both deals will walk. Anybody know, anybody know the Greek word for walk in, uh, Peripateo. Uh, somebody listening in class. Peripateo. Anybody know what peripateo means? Every aspect of your life. There's your life. Everything. Your life is, is made up of a whole bunch of stuff, isn't it? You know, I got to go to work. I got a mother. I got a father. I got a daughter. I got, blah, blah, blah. Your life is that circle. Sometimes you ought to put a circle there and write as much stuff as you got going. You'd be amazed how much your life is filled up with stuff. And then I always have a, a, a piece of, I call it a pie. I, put, I call it, this is what I call junk. I have a junk one. And that gets me in more trouble than anything I got going. 
the junk one. I put the junk one up there. I go, I, I should have been doing that. I, what was I thinking? I should have. I didn't have time to do that. I should have been cutting the grass or something. But no, I just had to go fish or something. I don't know. You know what I mean? I call it, I call it something. And usually that's the one that gets me. I don't know about you. You probably don't pay, pay much attention to peri potato as I do. But peri, that's the one part of that pie. Uh, I call it the junk because you don't know whether to keep or throw it away. That means it's not junk to you. It's some, somebody else and it's probably in the long run yours too. <laughs> right? <laughs> My mother really helped me when I was growing up because if I didn't wear something with it, what, once I got in, where I had some kind of stable growth, you know, at some point you outgrow your shoes every two months and clothes every four months or something. Once I got a stable place, if I didn't wear something within within a year, she, this is the idea was get rid of it. Somebody else needs to wear it. You didn't wear it in a year, somebody else needs to. Let's give it to somebody who will wear it. There's somebody out there, listen, and I, a lot of times I was the receiving end of that where some other, apparently my culture, my day I lived that people did that, and a lot of times they would pass it to people, hey, does Ronnie wear a yeah, yeah? Then I got the yeah, yeah. And a lot of times I was really thankful for it because it, it was probably better than something I might have bought, bought myself, you know, new. Uh, and Well, anyhow. Anyhow, every church age believer, every church age believer receives positional sanctification at the moment of salvation. Point three, uh, walking. That's where I was, walking. We call it experiential. Notice on your paper, that's called experiential sanctification. And one is by the it, walking in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, and the other is the faith cycle. These are two dynamics. Uh, the Holy Spirit, this is Galatians 5, 16, 17, and faith rest, of course, it involves many, but the key one is 1 Corinthians 5, 7, you walk by faith, not by sight. I put the faith cycle up there because I really believe it's essential for you to know and understand for you to really walk by faith. I don't think, and James really dealt with it. We've been dealing with James' subject on it. He said, listen, there's a real danger. A lot of you become do uh, hearers of the word, not doer. You remember? And so we've been dealing with that. I find that to be absolutely true. He was on to something there. Um, Second Corinthians 5, 7. Did I say first? Well, don't pay attention to that. Second, Second Corinthians 5, 7. Yeah, I, uh, I think First Corinthians 5, 7 has something to do with leaven. leaven. I don't know. Now you got me off track here. Don't take much to get me off track, right? I mean, I'll slide off that track in a heartbeat. For this is the will of God. Here is 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. You know, listen, by now, you guys who come on to my studies regularly, you always check my numbers. You know, always check my numbers because I get all that stuff backwards and stuff. Uh, this is your. This is the will of God. Your sanctification. That is. And watch the word that. Watch the word that. This is the will of God. Your sanctification. That is. Watch the word that now. That you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel. See, that's that's walk by walking in the spirit. That's the only power over the flesh. Only power of the flesh. Know how to possess his in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion. Like the Gentiles who do not know God. Here's another and that. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is an avenger of all these things. Just as we also told you before and solemnly warn you, for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. We've been called to live the sanctified life. That's experientially. How do I do it? You walk in the spirit, you walk by faith. See the two walks. And, and if you know, want to know what else he has to say about it, he says, then, th then you, when you do this, then you're walking in honor. You're walking worthy of the calling. 
you're walking worthy of the calling. And, um, and, uh, and again, I, I wrote down another verse for you. 2 Timothy 2.21 is well worth your read later. Now on the second page, but sanctifying Christ, watch what, watch what Paul says and, and, and think about how you're going to do this. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Sanct and you're told to do this. This is something personal, personal responsibility. You, but you sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. And listen to why, why it's beneficial. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Do it with, with gentleness and reverence. Now, how do, you, how do you sanctify Christ in you? That's experiential sanctification. That's experiential sanctification. See, you do it by cycling the word of God through faith and the, and the word under the ministry. You cycle. Faith works by the hearing and hearing the word of God cycled, the hearer and the doer part. And you have the power, all, you have always the power to fulfill whatever God has told you to do in the will of God, right? Because God is able to do what he's promised. You're not. you got to remember that sanctification reminds you, experiential sanctification reminds you that the power that comes to you <laughs> comes from outside but now works inside through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the word of God in your heart. You know, you know what, the, you, in context of what I just said, you know when the word of God is in your heart? Let me tell you. And someone needs a word from the heart to bring them to a place of assurance of their salvation or bring them into a place of salvation? You know where it comes from? It comes from the believer's heart. The word of God under the ministry of the Holy Spirit comes right out of that believer right into the need of the moment. Listen to this now. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. See? And listen, the more doctrine you have, the more hope you can share. Agreed? The more doctrine you have, the more hope you can share. And the more doctrine you have in your soul working in your heart, the more hope you can spread to those who enter your space. Come on now. Now, I'm ready to give an invitation on this thing, right? I mean, is that not powerful? And, and listen, here's that sanctify Christ in your heart. In your heart, that's the word of God brought there, and Christ is the theme of this whole journey. And listen, People step into our space. Isn't it amazing how God brings people into our space when we're ready to speak from our heart the truth of God? Isn't it amazing who he brings? It's just amazing. He, he just brings people into us. You know why? Listen to me. He tells you. Because we're what? Ready. Right? And it comes from our heart because we believe it. We believe it because we use it. We believe it because it works. We believe it because God said it. We believe it for a lot of reasons. But we're ready. And when we're ready, when, when we have come to a place where we sanctify Christ in our hearts and we're ready to share, he puts people in your six feet of space. He can fill your day up with some stuff, can't he? And it, isn't it interesting the days that you're on call that he brings all those people in there. And the days you're not on call, he doesn't bring anybody. Isn't that interesting? Ought to be. I think it ought to be. I just quoted from you from 1 Peter 3.15, if you paid attention to your paper. Here's, point, here's my point four and phase three. Phase three of new covenant sanctification is based on the promise the ultimate, when I say ultimate sanctification, we're talking about the ultimate. We're not just talking about dying and being with Christ in heaven. 
We're talking about the day when the rapture comes and we have our possession of the body and we are in full bloom operation back in the plan of God. We, we are not on sabbatical. We are not on leave, right? We're not, but listen, everybody in heaven right now is on leave waiting for what? The rapture, just like we are, except they, you know, they got a, probably a better view of it than we do, right? Because they've died and gone there. So when they hear about the, about the rapture, they're getting pretty excited, I guess. I mean, we get pretty excited about it, don't we? Especially those of us that have sanctified Christ in our hearts. So phase three, this is a reference to ultimate sanctification. Like in Romans 6, 23, and this is a key to eternal life. See, the key to eternal life, the whole doctrine of eternal life, this is the key to it. Um, I mean, as far as waiting. Um, but now having been freed from sin and a slave to God, see, that's sanctified Christ in your heart. When you sanctify Christ, when you begin to sanctify Christ in your heart, in your heart, not just your mind, in your heart, then you become more enslaved to God because you, you can't live without it. I mean, you don't want to because the joy of participating in the will of God in your life is, is just the high you can't get anywhere else. You get no, the world can't compete with that idea. Now having been freed from sin and slave to God, you deprive your benefit. You, you, you deprive, you derive, I don't mean deprive, you derive, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification in the outcome, eternal life. See, we have eternal life and the, then we're going to, and, and we got a gap in there, right? We get our resurrection body, eternal life becomes the life Eternal becomes a life eternal. See, right now we have eternal life. Then we have life eternal. Did you get that? Okay. Well, think about it. Smoke a cigar and it'll, it'll come to you. Not really. Not really. I, I don't think it'll come if you smoke a cigar. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.13. So that he may establish your heart. Watch that heart again. So that he may establish your heart without blame, in holiness. Hage sumai. That, that he will establish your heart without blame in holiness before God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. Okay. What's that song? When the saints come marching in. Makes you want to sing that song, doesn't it? Makes you want to sing it. Every church age believer will receive his resurrection body at the rapture of the church and, and will it then move what we call ultimate sanctification will now become experiential sanctification in eternal life, in the life of eternity. <laughs> and that's something. That God is so good. I mean, who could ever think this stuff up? Who could ever think this up? And, of course, uh, I put passages down there that are keys, like 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, in, in closing, point number five, every church-age believer, and I, there is so much confusion in, in Christianity over this issue. Every church-age believer becomes a saint, a hagios, at the moment of salvation. It's one of the, listen, it's one of 20 status privileges of every believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. When do you become a saint? The moment you believe, you're set apart. See, sanctification is the word holy. And when does that, when does that become part of my life at the point of salvation? At the point of salvation, if, if you're sanctified in Christ, you're a saint. If you're not, you're not. It don't matter what you do, don't matter how many awards the church gives you or the world, you're not a saint. If you're in Christ, you are. And the only way you can get in Christ is through the gospel. <clears throat> so, a saint is one of the 20 status privileges at the point of salvation.
It's part of the package of grace, salvation, of the 50 things that you can, if you're on the internet, you can go find the 50 things of salvation, pull it down and read. Don't read it, study it. Church age believer is not given the title saint because he has done something extraordinary for Christ, but rather because he believed Jesus Christ and believes that Christ did something extraordinary for him. You know, everybody's got sainthood, you know. If you reach a certain plateau, you're a saint. It's not true. As far as position, you get it at the point of salvation. And it's based on what Christ has extraordinarily done for you, not what you do for him. I mean, there will come a day when you'll get rewards and crowns and all that stuff, right? That's not what we're talking about. That, that's because you, you are a saint, <laughs> Won't well, because you you earned it somehow or another. Acts twenty thirty two, and now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. How about that? How about that? I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. In other words, saints. God is going to reward those saints who have taken seriously God and his word of grace. Colossians 1.12, Ephesians 1.18 would be passages that would be beneficial to you. Paul writes, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. I mean, those, everybody's a saint when they believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody's a saint. Everybody's a saint. So Paul writes in Philippians 4.21, greet every saint in, the, in Christ Jesus. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Greet them. You know what that means? It means don't look at the outside of them. Greet every saint. It doesn't, you don't look at their social standing. You don't look at their economical standing. You don't look at their racial standing. You don't look at any of the stuff that people look at. You're looking to see them in Christ. You greet every saint in Christ. Okay? Let's close in a word of prayer and we'll have our season of prayer. Tonight we hope those who have come to us by way of automobile and internet have been blessed by this basic important doctrine in the church. New Covenant Sanctification, and we've tried to lay it out as simply as we know so that a baby believer could grasp it and find it of great importance to their life. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for the grace that's provided us the freedom to gather an assembly in America at this church and spread our message throughout the world by Internet because we have the freedom of assembly where others don't. For some people, the only freedom they have tonight is that little box where this message is coming into them in some kind of secret place for fear of being caught and put in prison or tortured or murdered for Christ. And so... We pray for you. We pray that this message would give you the boldness and the courage to live a holy life for Christ. Won't be easy. But it's not dependent on you. It's dependent on the ministry of the Holy Spirit and your faith in the Word of God. 
remember what Paul says. It's not just about the word of God. It's the word of God of grace. That will set you free. And that is our prayer from America to you. We love you and pray you would come back and be with us as we go through this journey of scripture. Trying to teach you to get this, the stability of your life in Christ. There are people who need you. To give them the hope that has been built within you. For our, we've made our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.